Hey, what's up guys, it's Alex here from Simple Mods and welcome back to another video. Now today I'm checking out the new ASUS Prime X299 Deluxe motherboard and I also have the Intel Core i9-7900X CPU to see how it performs with this board. The ASUS Prime X299 Deluxe is definitely a striking looking motherboard with a more different look and feel from what ASUS have done in the past on the Prime series and I definitely prefer this X299 Prime look compared to how the um, Prime series looks on the Z370 chipset. So on X99 it definitely looks and feels a lot more premium. Now you'll of course get RGB on it just with this area here um, next to the VRO uh, cover and then just this line here of the PCH heatsink. Both of these areas will light up RGB and you can of course control those using software. Uh, but a thing to note however is that both of these areas scratch very easily and wiping them can leave micro scratches uh, which is definitely something I wish I didn't see on a motherboard at this price point. And speaking of price point it goes for around $700 in Australia and about $480 in the US. So it's definitely on the more premium side of things. Now this was of course at the time of filming so prices could change depending on when you're watching this video. So I'll make sure to put the links in the description below so you guys can check that out as well. So the motherboard is of normal ATX size and as the name suggests, it's on the latest Intel X299 chipset and features the new LGA 2066 socket supporting Intel's latest high-end enthusiast desktop processors for both Skylake X and Kaby Lake X as well. So this will pretty much work uh, across the board from the i5-7640X to the 18-core monster, the i9-7980XE. So I'll get some of the things uh, out of the way right off the bat that you should be aware of with this motherboard and X299 in general, mainly surrounding the Kaby Lake X CPUs. So with Kaby Lake X CPUs, there are only two of them, the i5-7640X and the i7-7740X. These uh, only feature 16 PCIe lanes and only support dual channel memory. So certain features uh, on this motherboard will be disabled if you use a Kaby Lake X CPU. Now when it comes to PCIe lanes, there are four PCIe 16X lengths. So you'll see them here. Um, this one here will be wired at 4X and the other three, which also feature the ASUS safe slot reinforcing, they'll be wired at 16, 16, and then eight for the bottom one. However, there are further limitations depending on what CPU you use. So I'm just gonna break it down uh, depending on the CPU lanes. So with a 44 lane CPU with the three main 16X length PCIe slots, they'll run at 16, 16, and then eight for the bottom one. So of course you can do three-way SLI with a 44 lane CPU, such as the i9-7900X, which is the one I have in the socket right now. And of course, all the CPUs above that as well. With a 28 lane CPU, you can do two ASLI, so they'll run at 16 and then eight. And then with a 16 lane CPU, they'll run at eight and then eight. So further from that, the third 8X wired PCIe slot, so the one at the very bottom just there. So this one with a 16 and 28 lane CPU, it will share bandwidth with SATA ports five and six. So those would be the very last two SATA ports just on the side here. And then the um, 4X lane, which is just the black one here, this will share bandwidth with USB 3.1 Gen 2, the front panel connector, which is just here. Um, so this will only occur with a 16 lane CPU in the socket. With a 28 and 44 lane CPU, it will run um, at 4X as normal. Then there are the um, two 1X slots, so just these two here. Two slots are disabled in the BIOS by default, and with any lane CPU that you use, the top one, so just the one here, this one will share bandwidth with the wireless AD Wi-Fi that's included on this board. And the bottom slot just here will share bandwidth with the um, SATA port 7, which is just a single SATA port that is just found in this area here. Now when it comes to memory, there are of course eight DDR4 DIMM slots and with Kaby Lake X CPUs being limited to only dual channel memory, you can only use the four DIMM slots just on the right hand side of the motherboard. So these are channels C and D. Um, with Kaby Lake X CPUs, it will support a maximum memory capacity of 64 gigs in these four DIMM slots here. Now with Skylake X, however, which supports quad channel memory, you can of course use all of the eight DIMM slots uh, found on this motherboard with a maximum memory capacity of 128 gigs and up to 4,000 megahertz in, the, in terms of frequency. And the frequency will apply to both Skylake X and Kaby Lake X CPUs as well. Now in terms of M.2 slots, there are two on the board. So there's um, one that's found just underneath the PCH heatsink here. So you can access this one just by undoing these um, three screws. And then uh, you'll also see underneath that there is a thermal pad that ASUS includes just with this bottom section um, of the cover there will be acting as a heat sink for the M.2 drive that you put underneath there. This is definitely a good feature and it's great to see um, this implementation used on pretty much all the ASUS X299 motherboards that I've checked out so far. Now the other M.2 slot is a vertical slot just next to the 24 pin, so it's just in this area here. Um, I don't quite like that because I don't like the idea of having to mount a drive vertically and also I believe it could get in the way um, of your 24 pin cable given that they're so close, so that'll probably depend on the certain case that you're using. There's also a um, U.2 connector, so it's just here. 
However, this one will share bandwidth with the um, vertical M.2 slot just here. So it's either one or the other. You either want to use the vertical M.2 slot or the U.2 slot. They will share bandwidth between each other. Also, a good thing to note is that the Asus Prime X299 Deluxe motherboard also supports the new Intel Optane M.2 drives. So it's a storage option that at the moment works best as a cache drive when paired with a more slower, more traditional hard drive. So the Intel Optane memory can significantly improve the read speeds of a slower hard drive, especially when reading small files with very low queue depths. So if I do have time over the next couple of weeks and if this is something that people are interested to see, I will have a sort of comparison video comparing the Intel Optane drives with other solutions available on the market and seeing sort of how they stack up against each other. But for now, back to the motherboard, there's also of course um, built-in audio, something I don't really uh, go into much details. I'm not a big audiophile and any decent motherboard out there at the moment will have very nice onboard sound for my taste. So the onboard um, audio is just in this area here, just labeled Crystal Sound, and that will offer a Realtek A-channel high-definition audio codec. Now, when it comes to performance, I tested the Intel Core i9-7900X at stock clocks. I had MCE enabled as well as disabled, and then I also did an overclock to 4.6 GHz on all cores at 1.26 volts. So the first thing I have to say is that you definitely won't be getting any decent temps running this thing on air, especially if you want to overclock. Even at stock clocks, um, I was seeing temps rise up into the upper 80s C with my Noctua NHU-12S cooler and then spiking over 100 degrees Celsius um, when trying to overclock, so that's definitely a no-go. So I switched to a 240 millimeter all-in-one cooler from uh, Cooler Master that I had on hand. So this is the new Cooler Master Master Liquid ML240L. Um, with RGB implementation that they've just released. And uh, for the rest of the test system, it consisted of 32 gigs of G-Skill Triton Z RGB, 3200 MHz DDR4 running in quad channel with the XMP profile applied, a one terabyte Samsung 960 Evo uh, M.2 drive as the boot drive. And then I also had a Founders Edition GDX 1080 graphics card and for the power supply, I ran the Cooler Master V1000. So the motherboard features an eight phase power delivery to the CPU. Um, with an eight and then a four pin for power and a two plus two phase power delivery to the memory. At the um, stock clocks, the Intel Core i9-7900X that I tested ran pretty smoothly with no drastic uh, voltage spikes or anything like that. So I was seeing the voltage hover around the 1.094 um, under load with the test that I ran and with the 240 millimeter Cooler Master um, all-in-one cooler. Temps were in the upper 50s at max um, during all the tests that I did, which is definitely a good thing to see. Um, so this definitely allowed some headroom in terms of uh, temperature and with good power delivery by the motherboard to the CPU, Intel Turbo Boost Max technology could kick in and do its thing, allowing the i9-7900X CPU to run uh, faster than its rated operating frequency. So with the multi-core frequency, depending on the software load that was being applied, I saw the um, core clocks hovering anywhere between the base of 3.3 gigahertz um, on the 7900X to about 4 to 4.3 gigahertz. And then I even saw some of the cores reaching a maximum of 4.8 gigahertz thanks to Intel Turbo Boost Max technology. Also, there was no difference in performance that I saw between having uh, MCE enabled or disabled in the BIOS. So the CPU frequency reached uh, as well as the voltage that was being applied stayed pretty much the same when enabling MCE in the BIOS. As you can see in the benchmark results as well, there are no differences in performance. So um, with overclocking, however, I decided to push my 7900X to 4.6 gigahertz at 1.26 volts. Pushing it any further than that would have meant having to increase the voltage and temps were definitely getting uh, out of control with the cooling solution that was being used. So achieving 4.6 gigahertz um, overclock was very smooth, however. All I did was change it to manual in the BIOS. So I uh, applied my memory timings and the frequency manually as well. I changed the multiplier to 46 and then manually set the V core at 1.26. So I don't have to really touch anything else and um, I was able to leave the load line calibration um, pretty much as is, um, as it comes from the BIOS um, on auto. So the um, CPU ran very stable at the 1.26 volts under load and I didn't see the voltage drop one bit with the increased performance from the stock test being about 16.43%. Definitely not a bad overclock on a 10 core 20 thread CPU. Um, on this motherboard. Now keeping in mind, however, so if you are planning to overclock these i9 CPUs, that you will need very good cooling. So even with the 240 millimeter all-in-one cooler, the AI attempts were reaching in the upper 90s with my 4.6 gigahertz overclock settings applied. So a larger radiator surface and a custom auto cooling loop perhaps will definitely help in trying to cool these um, i9 CPUs. Now I also ensured I had a fan over the VRM area at all times during testing, especially when the overclock settings were applied as these uh, VRMs can actually get pretty toasty on the X299. So I don't currently have a way of measuring the temps outside of software. However, under hardware monitor, they maintain a decent temp of about 40 degrees Celsius, 
However, that was of course with a 2200 RPM fan blowing air directly over the VRM area. Okay guys, so now let's uh, cover the onboard connectors. So there are six SATA 3 ports. They're just found in this area here. There's also a U.2 connector that I mentioned just previously, and then there's a further um, seven SATA port just down here. Now in terms of USB 3.1 Gen 1 ports, there are four on the back, and then there are four via the two internal headers. So there is one just here, and then there's a 90 turn around header just, uh, just here, just above the setup ports. In terms of USB um, 2.0, there are six ports, so there are four on the back and then two via the internal header, just here, right next to the USB 3.0 internal header at the bottom there. And in terms of USB 3.1 Gen 2, there are five in total on this motherboard, so there are four on the back, one which is a Type-C port, and then there is a fifth via the internal header um, just here. Further to that, there is also an internal Thunderbolt header, um, just at the bottom there. So if you're into Thunderbolt, um, you will get an internal header for that. And then uh, when it comes to fans, there are seven fan headers in total. So there are two for the CPU. So of course the CPU main um, and the optional CPU fan. So those are just up here in the left-hand corner of the motherboard. Then there are also two chassis fan headers. So there's one just here and um, another one just there. There's also an AIO pump just in this area here. So there's a header that just labeled um, for the AIO pump. And then um, at the bottom, just next to the M.2 slot, just here, there is a fan labeled M.2. Now, of course, you can use this with other normal fans. You don't necessarily have to use it uh, just to, to connect a fan to cool your M.2 or anything like that. So um, those are six headers that I've mentioned so far. So these six will run at one amp, so 12 watts of power each. And then there is a further um, seventh port, which is just underneath the SATA um, slots just here. This one is labeled water cooling pump. This one will offer a bit more power, so it'll run at three amps or 36 watts of power. Uh, this one will be able to power your um, DDC or D5 pumps directly from the header on the motherboard. And then of course, all of these seven ports I've mentioned, they all support PWM control, so you can do that through software. Um, or you can do it through the BIOS as well. Now when it comes to um, Aura RGB headers, there are two on this motherboard. So there is just one just at the top here next to the 8-pin power connector. And then there's a further one at the bottom. This one at the bottom here is an Aura addressable header. So with this one, you can connect addressable RGB LED strips. What, what it means by addressable is that you can actually control the individual LED on the um, addressable strip itself. So that's definitely a cool feature to have. In terms of onboard buttons, there is a power and reset just at the bottom here. That definitely helps, especially when you are testing a motherboard. Um, you will get a clear CMOS button just next to it as well. And then there is a Memo K button there too. Um, there's also a postcode readout uh, also at the bottom just there. Definitely a nice thing to have. And finally, something I didn't mention before, there is also a small LED display just here, pretty much smack bag in the middle of the motherboard. This will help uh, pinpoint errors from the BIOS, but you can also customize this with your own text or animation which is pretty cool and it's uh, definitely a nice new feature to have. Now further on the rear I.O. next to the many USB ports, some of the other ports that I didn't mention, um, of course there is a USB BIOS flashback, so there's the button for that just there. This one will most likely be used with the very bottom um, USB 2.0 port just here. So with that, then with the USB BIOS flashback feature, you can actually flash the BIOS on the motherboard even when you don't have a CPU um, installed in there. So that's definitely a nice feature to see. Um, then there are of course the Wi-Fi antenna connectors, uh, just with the black one here being used for the wireless AD that's featured on this motherboard. You will get two one gigabit Ethernet um, uh, ports, and then further from that, of course, you will get the um, audio connectors as well. So there you have it guys, the Asus Prime X299 Deluxe motherboard. In conclusion, a solid motherboard, but even a solid board won't stop the confusion that Intel's X299 chipset can create for some users. So I hope I managed to explain that well in this video. Now the motherboard is aimed at productivity with a ton of USB ports, new wireless AD standard, internal Thunderbolt port and all that. Um, but that's not to say that this board won't be good for gaming. But however, if all you're doing is gaming, then perhaps you should check out the newly launched Intel Z370 platform with the new um, i7 8700K being the new king uh, for gaming in terms of price to performance, especially. Um, so I do have a couple of videos uh, featuring Z370 on the channel already that you guys should check out if you're interested in that. However, if you are a prosumer and do more than just gaming, then the Prime X299 Deluxe is definitely a solid choice and a good base uh, to start your X299 platform on. So I decided to do this video a bit differently and show you guys what comes inside the box at the end of the video, seeing as not everyone might be interested in this and they just want to get straight into the board. I decided to um, sort of do the unboxing at the end of the video. So stick around if you do want to see that as well. And if you enjoyed this video, then hit that like button. Maybe consider subscribing to my channel as it does help out a lot and allows me to bring you guys more videos like this one. And hopefully I'll see you in the next one. Cheers.
Okay guys, so uh, inside the box with the motherboard you will get a Thunderbolt 3 card, uh, a mini DisplayPort cable that comes with it, and there's also the rear air shield of course, um, there's a two-way and a three-way high bandwidth SLI bridge, then you'll get the um, motherboard manual, a driver's disc, although mine is a review sample and just came with this disc thrown in here. However, always refer to the ASUS website and download the latest drivers from there. Um, there's also a driver's disc and a manual for the Thunderbolt 3 card. There's a safety information card, a fan extension card installation guide with the fan extension card that's also included. Then there's also a coupon for 20% off cable mod cables. So here's the coupon to whoever wants to try and use it first. Um, I guess it's a bonus for sticking around all the way to the end of the video. Now on the other side, um, in, in this bottom compartment here, you'll find the two Wi-Fi antennas, one for the wireless AC and then the other for the wireless AD. Um, then you'll get the addressable RGB LED strip extension cable. Usually there's an extension cable for the normal um, Aura header that's found on this board as well. However, I didn't find one in this box. Perhaps you might get one since mine is a review sample. They may have forgotten to, to put that cable in there. Um, further from that, there are three temperature sensors, a front panel cable connector, um, six SATA cables, then you'll get the vertical M.2 mount uh, along with the screws for that, and finally the fan extension card and the cables that go along with it.